Chapter Twenty Nine of the Money Moon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Money Moon, a romance by Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter Twenty Nine of the Moon's Message to Small Porges, and how he told it to Bellew, in a whisper. Bellew walked on at a good pace with his back turned resolutely towards the house of Dapplemere, and thus, as he swung into that narrow grassy lane that wound away between trees, he was much surprised to hear a distant hail. Facing sharp about, he espied a diminutive figure whose small legs trotted very fast, and whose small fist waved a weather-beaten cap. Bellew's first impulse was to turn and run. But Bellew rarely acted on impulse. Therefore he set down the bulging portmanteau, seated himself upon it, and, taking out pipe and tobacco, waited for his pursuer to come up. "'Oh, Uncle Porges!' panted a voice. "'You did walk so awful fast, and I called and called, but you never heard. And now, please, where are you going?' "'Going,' said Bellew, searching through his pockets for a match. "'Going, my Porges, why, um, for a stroll, to be sure, just a walk before breakfast, you know. "'But then, why have you brought your bag?' "'Bag,' repeated Bellew, stooping down to look at it. "'Why, so I have.' "'Please, why?' persisted Small Porges, suddenly anxious. "'Why did you bring it?' "'Well, I expect it was to, er, uh, to bear me company. But how is it you are out so very early, my Porges? Why, I couldn't sleep last night, you know, cause I kept on thinking and thinking about the fortune. So I got up in the middle of the night, and dressed myself, and sat in the big chair by the window, and looked at the money moon. And I stared at it, and stared at it, till a wonderful thing happened. And what do you suppose? I don't know. Well, all at once, while I stared up at it, the moon changed itself into a great big face. But I didn't mind a bit, because it was a very nice sort of face, rather like a gnome's face, only without the beard, you know. And while I looked at it, it talked to me, and it told me a lot of things. And that's how I know that you are going away, because you are, you know aren't you? Why, my Porges, said Bellew, fumbling with his pipe, why, shipmate, I... Since you ask me, I am. Yes, I was afraid the moon was right, said small Porges, and turned away. But Bellew had seen the stricken look in his eyes, therefore he took small Porges in the circle of his big arm, and holding him thus, explained to him how that in this great world each of us must walk his appointed way, and that there must and always will be partings, but that also there must and always shall be meetings. And so, my Porges, if we have to say good-bye now, the sooner we shall meet again, some day, somewhere. But small Porges only sighed, and shook his head in hopeless dejection. Does she... No, you're going, I mean, my Auntie Anthea? Oh, yes, she knows, Porges. Then I suppose that's why she was crying so, in the night. Crying? Yes, she's cried an awful lot lately, hasn't she? Last night, when I woke up, you know, and couldn't sleep, I went into her room, and she was crying, with her face hidden in the pillow, and her hair all about her crying. Yes, and she said she wished she was dead. So then, of course, I tried to comfort her, you know, and she said, I'm a dreadful failure, Georgie, dear, with the farm and everything else. I've tried to be a father and mother to you, and I failed in that, too. So now I'm going to give you a real father. And she told me she was going to marry Mr. Cassilis. But I said, no, "'Cause I arranged for her to marry you and live happy ever after. "'But she got awful angry again, and said she'd never marry you "'if you were the last man in the world, "'cause she spised you so.' <laughs> "'And that would seem to settle it,' nodded Bellew gloomily. "'So it's good-bye, my Porges, 
We may as well shake hands now and get it over. And Bellew rose from the portmanteau, and, sighing, held out his hand. Oh, but wait a minute, cried Small Porges eagerly. I haven't told you what the moon said to me last night. Ah, to be sure, we were forgetting that, said Bellew, with an absent look and a trifle wearily. Why, then, please sit down again so I can speak into your ear, cause what the moon told me to tell you is a secret, you know. So perforce Bellew reseated himself upon his portmanteau, and, drawing Small Porges close, bent his head down to the anxious little face. And so Small Porges told him exactly what the moon had said. And the moon's message, whatever it was, seemed to be very short and concise, as all really important messages should be. But these few words had a wondrous and magical effect upon George Bellew. For a moment he stared wide-eyed at Small Porges like one awaking from a dream. Then the gloom vanished from his brow, and he sprang to his feet. And, being upon his feet, he smote his clenched fist down into the palm of his hand with a resounding smack. "'By heaven!' he exclaimed, and took a turn to and fro across the width of the lane, and, seeing Small Porges watching him, caught him suddenly up in his arms and hugged him. "'And the moon will be at the full to-night,' said he. Thereafter he sat him down upon his portmanteau again, with small porges upon his knee, and they talked confidentially together, with their heads very close together, and in muffled tones. When at last Bellew rose, his eyes were bright and eager, and his square chin prominent and grimly resolute. "'So you quite understand, my porges?' "'Yes, yes, oh, oh, I understand. Where the little bridge spans the brook. The trees are thicker there. Ay, ay, Captain. Then fare thee well, shipmate. Good-bye, my Porges. And remember. So they clasped hands very solemnly, big Porges and small Porges, and turned each his appointed way, the one up, the other down the lane. But lo, as they went, small Porges's tears were banished quite, and Bellew strode upon his way, his head held high, his shoulders squared, like one in whom hope has been new-born. End of chapter 29